All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of It Is. Well, this is a special, actually, feature presentation of It Is. This is ABC Chat starring my friend, my homie, my uh, business partner, just everything, Alexander Brodman. I'm so excited to be reconnected. We don't always get a chance to do an episode, but we try to come at least monthly uh, with an episode of ABC Chat. So I have with us my friend, like I said, just amazing sales executive, ABC Chats. A uh, premier host, uh, Alexander Brockman. If you can see, connect with them at the link below. I got his lower third together, uh, so you connect with him. Then I'm looking forward to this episode. He has an amazing guest that he invited on this show, Eduardo Alvarez, and I'm so excited for this episode today. With that being said, I'll turn over to my friend, Alex. Alex, take it away. Hey, welcome back to the ABC Chats podcast, everybody. So this is a, this is a fun show that uh there's been a lot of people talking about and a lot of people that have been kind of reaching out to to everybody kind of asking some specific questions and one of them was can you guys talk about the difference between personal branding and corporate branding and so cody and i were chatting about this and you remember and i we were like there's really only one person that we can bring on here to to talk about this and that person you know luckily accepted our invitation so that person is sitting in front of us it's eduardo alvarez and so um after you know eduardo's got a, a rich history in this in this spectrum and you know after completing his undergraduate education at new york's fordham university eduardo started his career working for the government of puerto rico leading uh at the office in boston and after one year of uh working in the private sector he was offered a position with the bank of boston as an international banker working in the americas working in africa working in europe and then after about a decade in banking, took all of uh, those professional skills and strategic branding expertise into, you know, kind of the, the, the design world. And, and Eduardo specialized in helping financial institutions and uh, basically become more competitive in understanding the, the mechanics and the mindset of, of, of branding, all the things that we're going to be talking about now. But over the last five years, Eduardo, after completing a, uh, a change leadership graduate program at Columbia University in New York, Eduardo was focused on uh, his energies on developing culture and executive coaching engagements in a variety of businesses and non-for-profit organizations. And so I don't know what else, what, what other room there is to, to go fill in there, Eduardo, but let everybody know, you know, you know, just any anything that I missed. Did I did I botch it? Did did we get it all right? How's that sound? Not not at all. So perhaps a little too much. <laughs> but I mean, uh, there's, but but I'm old, so I mean, I'm Midwest called Newground, and so there was uh, several different companies that that Newground uh, has has in its holding company. But we were all we were all part of either Newground or Adrenaline. And so that's where all of us had met. And I've worked with Eduardo countless times. We've gone to some of the uh, most rural portions of the Midwest together. And so bringing the, you know, bringing this and then bringing, you know, Eduardo, the New York, uh, the New York, you know, Eduardo Alvarez, it was, it was very entertaining to see people's reactions to uh, just, you know, kind of the experience and the expertise and all these different things. But uh, it was, it was truly probably two of the best years of my life working with Cody and working with Eduardo and kind of learning from uh, these, these just savvy professionals. And uh, you know, when Cody and I were talking about, okay, so how do you break down the difference between what, what does it actually mean to have, you know, branding? What is that for that Eduardo? When, when somebody says that, when somebody says, what is branding? What is, uh, what does that mean? What's like the technical definition of branding? Are you able to share that with us? Uh, before I do, I'm going to turn the tables around and ask you a question. Ooh. Ooh. Yes, uh, think a little bit, the concept of brand and branding, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay. When do you think it surfaced among humans? When do I think branding surfaced among humans? Man, just quick first century. First century, you were off by 2800 oh. years. Ah, branding first that surfaced was... with the Egyptians, really, basically by marking cattle to make sure that your neighbor didn't steal your cows. Interesting, 
branding goes all the way back. And the same way that they did it with cattle, then, you know, when you get to the this brand, and there's confusion about brand and branding. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to give you, you know, it's a mind for about 25 years. And I am a believer in borrow, steal, and adapt. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there are, you know, no such things as completely new ideas. Right. And, uh, but one of my favorite branding gurus is a guy in New York that worked uh, here for many years by the name of Alan Adamson. Mm-hmm. And he distinguishes between brand and branding. Uh, which I thought it was it was, it was it was very well done. Brand being a collection of associations that lives in your brain, and uh, you know, and they're there because of all the stimuli that you get from the outside world. If I say Coca Cola, something pops up. If I say Tylenol, something else pops up, or Apple, or United Way. So really, it it are those images of, you know, a product or a service or an organization for that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that is the brand, the concept of brand. Concept of branding is really about developing a process of creating what he calls signals. And it's those signals that trigger then, you know, that's... uh, those associations that are in your brain. So there are two different things. One is brand as such as that stamp, if you will, and branding is what happens. Mm. You know, it could be a logo, that could be corporate colors, that could be storytelling, that could be TV advertising, whatever it is. You know, those are the signals that trigger, you know, that concept of brand. Uh, but the most important thing is that together, you know, the ultimate reason or the ultimate goal for brand uh, is really to meet a critical need. And I think that works for corporations and that also works for the personal branding that you were talking about, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, few, a few minutes ago. So that in essence is where I start, you know, my work as a brand practitioner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't like to use the word consultant. Too many consultants in the world. <laughs> uh, and not enough practitioners. So, you know, that's uh, that's where I come from in terms Very of nice. brand. How does how does a company you know go go about the process of establishing their brand? What is there you know kind of a blueprint or there mechanics to it? You know, what, what's, what's that like? Can you describe that for us? Uh, yeah, that's where the practitioner comes from. Okay, there it is. <laughs> it's, uh, if you will. And uh, in all my years doing, uh, doing this for different types of companies, uh, but especially financial institutions, as you mentioned before. And uh, I know that we're, when we're talking, preparing for, the, uh, uh, for this program, we talked about five different phases Mm. and uh, rethinking it later on. I said, that's getting too complicated. Ooh, got a fresh uh, set of ideas coming. I have basically come up with three different levels. Most of my colleagues will do something like this, whether it's three or five or eight, you know, there has to be a process. And I like to call it mechanics because the mechanics is something that implies strength, force, change, movement. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important things in branding, especially in today's world, movement. If a brand is static, a brand dies. You know, a brand has to live on. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so the three categories in my mind when I I start a project, uh, uh, the first one is what I call the analytic the second, and the third, the developmental. So then it's uh, it's a mouthful, but, you know, bear with me and I'll try and make it as simple as possible. Perfect. Uh, The analytic is 
when I go as a practitioner with a team, much like you and I went to teams in Iowa, and it's mm -hmm. a, and we learn the business of the client. That's role number one. Learn the business, learn the business plan, learn the business model. You don't have to be an expert. You know, it's uh, if the business is uh, growing corn, but you should know something or other about right. how, you know, the farming works. It'll help. Uh, it will help. So once you, so, and, and the way to learn about the business is by taking a deep dive with the people in the company, not mm -hmm. just the C-suite, but also with key staff members, because the C-suite will give you one perspective, the key people in the company will give you another, and goes out and does uh, some kind of brand audit. So okay. go out and look at what the company has, what the market has, that projects that particular brand. And again, from logos and corporate uh, colors to different taglines, to merchandising, to advertising, you name it. Wherever mm -hmm. the brand exists, you go and take a look. And you know, grab examples, take photography, go into the websites, examine the social media, because that is very, very important. Mm -hmm. this day and age so the brand audit and then the third one is about customer and market research got it and that's very important because that is the other part of the equation is listening to what the consumer is saying what the customer is saying about the company but also about the industry so you right. learn a great deal sometimes uh my clients have had already some kind of research done which is great, and we take it back with us, and then we dissect it. Uh, have to make sure that research is not more than 18 months old, because right. then it gets real old, because you know the consumer world changes very rapidly. The other thing about the market research is that we try not to get bogged down in the details, uh, especially if you have research companies doing, you have tons of quantitative data and that can you know, twist your head mm -hmm. and, uh, and sort of prevent you from really looking at the real insights. Mm. So, so that is the analytical part. Okay. The business model, the brand audit, and then the research. Got it. So those, that's the you mechanics that? of kind of, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so, we bring that to, to our company, to our shop, uh, as you will. And because that is going to be very, very instrumental in working through whatever the brand issue is going to be. The second phase is what we call the strategic. And there you start working in tandem with the client. Mm. The thing that we do, and you've seen this before, is get a group of senior people in the company and as well as the branding team and spend a day or two in some kind of an ideation session. Got it. And the ideation session, what it really does is that it examines all the data that has been collected to that point, uh, but also gives an opportunity for the company and you know the team, the practitioner team, to discuss where does we want that brand to go, hmm. you know, it's uh, all sorts of ideas will come uh, will come out of that, and uh, again we take that back to our shop, and then start doing the real thinking, and we have to come up with two basic deliverables. One has to do with what is the brand idea, mm -hmm. what is the brand going to be. What are you going to be known for in the marketplace? It's probably the easiest way to do it. And uh, and then based on that brand idea, then we go into the brand signals, which is how do you translate that into all the things that are going to expand your brand in the marketplace? Like I mentioned before, everything from websites to social media to traditional media to 
brochures, to, you know, whatever it is that has Everything. your imprint in. Because you weren't listening to the people right. <laughs> that are going to be the ones responsible. Right. So I learned my lessons years ago and working hand in hand in partnership with the client is absolutely imperative for the success of running absolutely Does that makes sense so far mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it's I mean, just like the the lesson that you said it kind of sounds exactly like you know traditional processes going from you know back in the industrial revolution you know let's figure out what we're going to do we'll go away and we'll do it and then we'll come back and we'll deliver it to you is now switching more into this you know for the last 20 or 30 years it's been switching more to the agile methodology where you know, the professional services, the practitioners are working in tandem with owners from the client side and their engagement owner that is really, you know, kind of, that has the ability to, to sign checks, that has the ability to make decisions, that has the ability to, to make the calls, um, you know, because that's going to be something that helps the efficiency of the process that also helps um you know make sure that you know just like you said you don't go away and then you come back and say look at all this amazing stuff that we did and they say i have no idea what <laughs> where you came up with any of this because that does not resemble us yeah, and, you know, that didn't happen a lot but it has happened you know <laughs> i think you learn which is what i call developmental and that has two parts mm. one i call the pull in and the other one the push out which, you know, which are cutesy terms for basically saying an internal launch and an external launch. Mm -hmm. uh, internal being right. the people that need to live the brand on a daily basis. And external, obviously, is your consumer and your market at large. Now, it's interesting that the pull-in and that cultural part, we didn't pay a lot of attention to for many years. I'd say it's only in the past five, seven years that some of the larger firms started to really pay attention to that, you know, to the internal development of the brand uh, because they realize that mm -hmm. it affects everything that happens. And ultimately everything that happens inside a corporation is projected somehow or other sometimes even through osmosis, you know, it's, uh, and you know, it's, it's when you walk into a place and you know that people don't feel comfortable talking to you or selling to you or whatever it is, you know, if people are not trained or not engaged with the brand, they will not be able to do that. So, you know, the study of what a corporate culture is and that, you know, internal launch and development of the brand has become one of the big, big, one of the big things. And that was one of the reasons actually I went back to graduate school and, uh, and did some studies on, you know, organizational behavior uh, and, and change management. Because at the end of the day, if you're gonna keep a brand alive, you're gonna have to change at, you know, as time goes by. So, you know, that is, you know, one of the, one of the most important parts that we had missed in the past, but now I think a lot of people are taking very, very seriously. It's uh, how do you engage the staff? You know, it's uh, whether it's a corporate staff or you have, you know, plants or retail stores, whatever it is, everybody should be in many ways singing from the same hymn book here. Uh, and, and that's what then creates that brand culture. And a lot of the work I have been doing the past few years deals more with that and the coaching of executives to make sure that all the pieces are pulled together in, uh, in dating, you know, that internal uh, way of doing things. That makes sense. And Ronald, let me you, you mentioned um, keeping the brand alive by producing activity, right? That brands cannot stay static. If you're static, you will die. Change movement, right? 
When we look at uh, change movement, obviously, I think that 2020 has been one of the most externally um, uh, external producing factors that should initiate some type of change, right? From a global pandemic and to the uncovering of transparency within social uh, activity or social justice. So how uh, do brands, well, I guess it's a two part question. The first part is, have brands woken up? Have they awakened to the state that they have to respond to societal factors? And then the second part is, has that awakening, if it has happened, has it been enough? And, and we'll start with there. I wish I had a crystal ball <laughs> and, uh, to answer that last part of the question. But uh, I think you know, it, in, in, in looking out in the marketplace and talking to people and going to webinars and all the things we have done sure. during the quarantine, I'm, I'm seeing certain trends. One is that, you know, brands that take it seriously are looking at the short term and then they're looking at the long term. The long term and, and the, you know, and, and obviously they come together. Mm. Uh, but as you will say, I mean, we are in a confluence of pandemic, recession, and the whole racial justice issue, which I think it has gone up to the level of the other two. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we have to really, you know, contend with all three uh, at the same time. And so companies need to come up first and foremost with messaging that is authentic and mm -hmm. that is believable, you know, to put up there. Uh, and then follow that with actual, you know, blacks, you know, just simple things. I had a problem with, and I had to consult an orthopedic surgeon a few years back, and I go for checkups and so on. Well, now every two months, I get a newsletter from that practice, and the newsletter addresses actual issues uh, of people in that, you know, in their area of expertise, particularly because people are spending gazillion hours in front of a screen, right. you know, zooming left and right, you know, sitting instead of standing. They had never done that before. I actually read it when I get it. You know, I said, wow, you know, these guys are really thinking ahead of the game. Right. You know, it's uh, the way advertising has changed. You know, it's, uh, it, it's more you know, about what people need as opposed to what people want. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the way that consumers react has changed right. dramatically. You know, it's uh, there was an article, I don't know, yesterday in the, forget if the Times or the Washington Post that talked about uh, the business in this country of gentlemen's clothing. Mm -hmm. It has been totally decimated because people don't need suits, don't true. need formal shirts, That's true. don't need ties, don't need expensive shoes. I, mean, I remember one time in my life when I was a banker, I had 10 suits, 50 red ties, you know, six pairs of shoes, and I don't need any of mm -hmm. that anymore. So, I mean, it, it's what some brand practitioners are calling that the go-to brands are the ones that are going to thrive in the future, the ones that offer things that you are going to need. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, for the moment, we're in a crisis, so the wants are not so important. Mm -hmm. Is that where you were going, Cody? With yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I guess the creating an authentic message uh, and then actually having an implementation strategy that follows. Do you think um, corporations are forced to respond out of pressure instead of out of authenticity? Um, and if that is the case, um, 
what they're for or what is the solution? Should there just be a complete overhaul of the system? Uh, I mean, like, where do we start? So is it is it is it pressure to respond based off of societal external factors or is it real authenticity? Well, hopefully <laughs> right. a lot of the brands are already authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it. But yeah, let's take for granted that, you know, X percent. Uh, well, I think that X percent is going to face some serious problems hmm. uh, in the future. You know, it's uh, because people see through. People, consumers see more than we give them credit for. Even brand practitioners like myself and my colleagues, they, they really can. You know, that's why they gravitate towards certain brands. That's why they gravitate towards Southwest Airlines. You know, it's uh, they trust Southwest to get me from point A to point B in the United States of America. I mean, that's very important. They trust uh, uh, Apple, of course. Mm -hmm. They may be, you know, scream and yell, you know, it's uh, because of the pricing or you know, we have another iPhone, you know, you know, we're in the iPhone 27 and a half. And, but at the end of the day, they do gravitate because they know that they're authentic and they have the consumer's best interests in mind. Uh, so I mean those are they will those companies will have to probably you know twist their business models somehow uh, or somewhat depending on how things move in terms of the pandemic, the economy and some of the social issues. Uh, but you know it's uh, People will see through, you know, hmm. if a company is not uh, is not authentic. Hmm. Yeah, I That's think that authenticity goes two ways. And Cody, you let me know if there's anything else that comes to mind. But like at the start of the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, and, and there's two examples. One example, at the start of the pandemic, it looked like one agency basically did ads for quite literally every different company. And I posted about it on LinkedIn. It looked like every company had the same hey, we're all in these uncertain circumstances. Right. We're all in this together. We're here for you. Let, you know, you know, just let us know. And it, it looked like every, and there were big names in there. There was, you know, all, th there was a ton of people in there. And then there's also, you know, kind of the, the same thing that happened when, you know, sort of some of the Black Lives Movement stuff uh, started happening earlier this year. Um, you know, the, there was just similar messaging and so I think that's where Eduardo, I think, and you let me know if, if I'm, if I'm wrong, but that authenticity, if it just sounds like what everybody else is saying, even though you may mean it, it doesn't really seem authentic because it's getting lost in what everybody else is already saying is so, you know, Cody, is there, it was, was there anything else that like anything that, that Eduardo was saying that, that jumped out at you? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I, I do think there are similar patterns to how the message is being communicated. I also think that when you don't have a solution, you look for the uh, the answer that will create less havoc, right? So, and what I mean by that is like, well, because we do have uh, on a organizational level a lack of diversity. We have this, and we don't have this addressed we answer it by not making ourselves look terrible. So it's the lesser of the two options. Hmm. And I think that's where that, that similarity comes in. That same monotone voice is almost like the same Allstate guy, you know, for every insurance company, right? <laughs> right, right. right, right. And, I, and I, think it's, I think it's obviously it's, it's the safe way to go about it. Right. Uh, but it also shows inherent uh, distraction and weakness. And Rada, we'll close with this. And last question, um, future. Future branding, future branding. Is this the ultimate age of disruption? Are, are, is there, are you too big or, or is it still you're too big to fail? Well, remember, you know, we, we've been saying that everything is too big to fail for, <laughs> for decades, you know, in one way or another. You know, this is, I think, a, a more important crisis than I have seen in my lifetime, mm. you know, it's, uh, and I have been in the working world for four decades. Mm. You know, I have been through recessions. I have been through 2008, uh, 
you know, this is different and has a different feel because mm. it's not only economic, it's also health and it's also societal. And all have come together. Mm. You know, it's, uh, and I think that the companies that will succeed are the ones who can bring the together in a, in a way that is authentic. And it, it will mean that you're going to have to start looking at different business models or different ways of approaching consumers. You know, and I'll leave you with something that that a friend of mine gave me the other day that I thought it was very, uh, very poignant. Uh, everybody knows, you know, the Ford Foundation you know, one of the largest foundations. And I think it's the second largest. They have like 13 billion in endowment and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it, this day and age is uh, being led, uh, the top guy, the CEO, is an African-American. Mm -hmm. So he looks at things a little bit differently. And one of the things that they have done over the past two months in response to the pandemic is instead of giving money away, you know, and taking it out of the earnings of, you know, the uh, the money they already have in the bank. They went out and for the first time, this is a social agency, by the way, this is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. They raised $1 billion in bonds. They issued a bond for $1 billion called a social bond to utilize that money to deal with COVID, Black Lives Matter, and the economic. That, I mean, that is that is twisting a mm -hmm. business model around. Absolutely. And it's, I haven't been able to stop thinking about, you know, it's, uh, I'm sure there was a lot of thinking and, you know, it's uh, brainstorming or whatever it was, but they're doing something completely different that has immediate effect on mm. what is happening today. Now, uh, let's see whether our corporate friends well, can match things like that. That's impressive. Awesome. Well, look, we appreciate it. Uh, this has been an amazing episode. Eduardo, where can they connect with you? What are you doing? What am I doing? Uh, doing uh, executive coaching and, uh, and some uh, consulting, but uh, but mostly executive coaching, and especially around the areas of uh, corporate culture. You know, it's uh, working with a lot of uh, C-suite uh, type uh, personalities, which is always interesting. And uh, even more interesting is because of communications and uh, you know technology. I've had clients in Africa. I've had clients in Europe. I have a client in South America, as well as here in New York, uh, which makes it uh, not only diverse, but much more interesting and a rich mix of people, especially in the day and age that we're in. Right. And your travel expenses are way down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> way down. Hey, I, hey, way I was down. Gonna, hey, right. Alex, we're going to connect with you. What are you doing, man? Hey, you know that uh, pretty much the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. So it's uh, LinkedIn, A Brockman or Alex Brockman at CSG. Um, that's pretty much where I spend the vast majority of my day is, is connecting with people and, and engaging in conversations and building a network on, link, on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. Look, connect with these amazing gentlemen, these my friend Alice, connect with Eduardo. These guys are really subject matter professionals in their field. Hit them up on LinkedIn. That's the easiest way to connect with them. Thursday, have an amazing episode really dealing with sports and their reaction to social justice surrounding the shooting of Jacob Blake. I have Terry Cummings coming on, ex-Milwaukee um, Bucks player. I have uh, waiting on Kendall Gill uh, to let me know yay or nay, <laughs> but I'm just throwing about there now at Will Gill. He's a podcast hosted on Chicago Sports Next. Uh, just a few. I also have the chaplain or former chaplain for the Chicago Bulls. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be amazing. Connect with my friends. Until next time, guys. Thanks. Thank you.